Welcome back, my wonderful viewers. This is the fourth installment of the Evolutionless series titled Evolutionless, Episode 4, Genetic Mutations. As you can see, I'm showing my face in this video, which was requested by friends of mine. Tell me what you think in the comment section. So far in the series, we have seen one abysmal attempt to debunk evolution after another, and this will probably be no exception. Already, just from the name, I imagine that I can preemptively guess the author's supposed attack. More than likely, the author will state that, having no understanding of what mutations are, all mutations are deleterious or harmful to the individual. This view was taken by creationists for a long time, but now even Answers in Genesis proclaims that not all mutations are harmful. Perhaps this author should take a hint. Anyway, let's get to the video, which starts with an ironic intro from the evolutionary biologist from the last video, Dr. Lewa. Mutation was the real creative force behind evolution, and natural selection, said the mutationists, just wasn't needed. I'm slightly confused by what Dr. Lewa is saying, so I'll try to interpret it correctly. He says that natural selection said mutation wasn't needed, but what I think he means is that proponents of natural selection in Darwin's day thought that mutations were solely deleterious. I know that he knows the importance of mutations since he's an evolutionary biologist. Within the modern neo-Darwinian synthesis, however, both mutations and natural selection are necessary for speciation. As we established in the previous video, natural selection only acts on what is already there, so there must be a mechanism by which new genetic material is added. This mechanism is genetic mutations. Do mutations work? Well, that depends. The genetic code is known as redundant because different codons, or sets of three nucleotides, can code for the same amino acid, which in turn makes proteins when combined with other amino acids. If a mutation occurs in a redundant codon, then it is possible that the codon will simply code for the same amino acid. Of course, we also know that both deleterious and beneficial mutations occur in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So yes, mutations do work. Next, is it true that mutations are a mechanism of evolution? Yes. Now, what is often not mentioned, or very seldom ever mentioned, is that in order for this evolution to take place, something has to be added, and it is called new genetic information. That is very rarely even brought up in the evolution discussion, but it is a critical component if evolution is going to work. Oh great, the guy who has no conception of any modern evolutionary biology has returned to tell us why mutations can't be a mechanism of evolution. Well, actually, if he knew anything about evolutionary biology, he doesn't, then he'd know that the appearance of new genetic information, I don't think he actually knows what new genetic information even is, is discussed quite often by biologists, specifically in the field of genetics. Where does new genetic information come from? For example, if we were to get a new arm, we walked out of a room and we had three arms, that is new, not, not new genetic information, that's just redundant information. But suppose we were to grow feathers or a trunk like an elephant on us. Now that would require a new set of instructions or new information, because that does not exist in human beings first. Considering that this is the same guy who said natural selection isn't natural selection, I'm not impressed with his understanding of biology. Now the making of an arm isn't coded by a single gene, it's a cascade of genes and interactions started by Hox genes, which he unsurprisingly doesn't know. The magnitude of each mutation that he's proposing would probably be lethal if it were not already nearly impossible especially in the case of the elephant trunk or feathers. Well, let's take another example. Suppose you just brought a brand new computer. And all this computer can do is word processing. And one day you decide, I'd like to start doing some graphic work. So I want to start doing some design and draw pictures. What do you have to do for your computer to perform those graphics? Well, you have to add some new software. In other words, you have to add a new set of instructions or new information in order to do this new function. That, again, is a critical component of evolution. He made the age-old creationist fallacy by comparing a computer's code to genes. The reason this comparison doesn't work is DNA replicates with the aid of enzymes and mutations sometimes form. There is no human oversight of DNA replication, but there is in the creation of new computer code, which is why it fails as an analogy for mutations. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? This is the famous, or should I say infamous, clip of Dawkins where he's asked to name a single mutation or evolutionary process that's resulted in new genetic information and he pauses for 11 awkward seconds. Creationists toss this clip around all the time in an attempt to show that Dawkins can't think of a single mutation that has ever added genetic material or caused a new protein to be coded for. 
In reality, Dr. Dawkins claimed he was unhappy to be interviewed by creationists as he thought he was going to be met by impartial interviewers. The answer he gave following the question was indeed irrelevant, and his response to the event was somewhat unprofessional. However, that's on him. On the other hand, Dr. Dawkins has actually provided evidence of mutations adding genetic information, especially in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth. It's very interesting, by the way. Examples include elephant tusks, the pod Mercari lizards, and E. coli bacteria. However, even if Dr. Dawkins couldn't think of a mutation that adds genetic information, then that wouldn't mean none exists. It just means he couldn't think of one. So let's start with what we know about mutations. Now mutations can be detrimental, they can be neutral, and they can be, in some instances, what we would call beneficial. Now what do we know about detrimental mutations? They cause disease, sickness, and death. And you know what we know about dead things? They don't evolve. So no, no evolution there. Then we can have neutral mutations. They cause no change, no difference. Therefore, no evolution there. So the only hope for evolution is the beneficial ones. But will a beneficial mutation allow for evolution to occur? And the answer is no. You see, in order for that to occur, we must have a beneficial mutation. Incidentally, it has to be random too, not a program one, but a random mutation that is beneficial. This creature must survive and it must be able to reproduce itself. While he's right that dead organisms don't evolve, good going genius, his assertion that beneficial mutations don't cause new genetic information is wrong, not least because he still hasn't defined what genetic information actually is. He apparently neither knows the definition of evolution nor what would constitute a beneficial mutation, so his expertise on the topic is nil. Also, mutations aren't wholly random. There's a rate of mutation in all organisms. For humans, there's about one mutation per 10 million nucleotides. Let's take a look at some quotes from some scientists who work in these areas. The first one comes from three different scientists, and they have the degrees in physics and neurophysiology. And I quote, However, the fact is that no empirical research has ever shown that matter left to itself is capable of creating universal information. Wow, talk about objectivity. All three people this guy picked are creationists. Next, I think the quote is supposed to say creating universal information instead of creation universal information. And what on earth is universal information? I have no idea what that means, so I I'm going to hope he'll define it for us. Here's another quote from a professor of genetics, and this man is a top evolutionist. And I quote, The typical mutation is very mild. It usually has no effect, but shows up as a small, get this word, decrease in viability or fertility. Each mutation leads ultimately to one genetic death. Wow, this new quote is taken totally out of context. The original paper this comes from, which I know this guy hasn't read by the way he's using the quotation, is titled, The High Spontaneous Mutation Rate, Is It a Health Risk? The paper describes the neutral theory of molecular evolution, which Dr. James Crow is a proponent of. However, if one were to actually read the paper, then he or she'd know that this paper has nothing to do with doubting the process of evolution. Allow me to quote it directly. Open quote. In Drosophila, the rate of mutations causing minor deleterious effects is estimated to be about one new mutation per zygote. Because of a larger number of genes and a much larger amount of DNA, the human rate is presumably higher. Recently, the Drosophila data have been reanalyzed and the mutation rate estimate questioned. But I believe that the totality of evidence supports the original conclusion. The most reasonable way in which a species can cope with a high mutation rate is by quasi-truncation selection, whereby a number of mutant genes are eliminated by one genetic death. This means an organism's genes won't be passed on because it died before reproducing. My topic is mutation. Mutation is the ultimate source of variability on which natural selection acts. For neutral changes, it is the driving force. Without mutation, evolution would be impossible. My concern, however, is not with mutation as a cause of evolution, but rather as a factor in current and future human welfare. Since most mutations, if they have any effect at all, are harmful, the overall impact of the mutation process must be deleterious and it is this deleterious effect that I want to discuss." Close quote. Let us now move down to page to find the quote chosen by this guy. Open quote. Mueller made essentially the same point. In his words, each mutation leads ultimately to one genetic death, since each mutation can be eliminated only by death or failure to reproduce. This seems like a large mutation load even for flies, and would surely be an excessive load for the human population. Furthermore, it is likely that our total mutation rate is greater than that of flies. So, we have a problem. 
There is a way out, however. In stating his genetic death principle, Mueller stated, For each mutation, then, a genetic death, except insofar as, by judiciously choosing, several mutations may be picked off in the same victim. Thus, natural selection, acting in a way that seems reasonable for both fly and human populations, can indeed pick off several mutations at once. Close quote. The mutations he's referring to are deleterious ones. It would appear that rather than actually reading the paper where the quote originated, creationists are content to just spout whatever they hear. There's another gentleman who has his PhD in genetics, and he says, Amazingly, there are still no known mutations which unambiguously create or add information, not even the ones that are considered beneficial. Now here's another gentleman who has his PhD in chemistry. It seems fair to point out that evolutionists have yet to provide even a single concrete example of a mutation leading to an increase of information as required. Now here's another gentleman. He happens to have his PhD in human biology. And I quote, about four in 10,000 of no mutations are presumed to be beneficial. However, these are only beneficial in a very narrow sense since they involve a loss of function. Not one of these mutations unambiguously created new information. John Sanford, Royal Truman, and Jerry Bergman are all creationists, so their ability to be objective in this matter is highly disputed. This guy only uses quotes from evolutionary biologists when he takes what they say completely out of context. Are we seeing a trend here? See, the scientists know mutations do not add new information, not even the so-called beneficial ones. Let's take a look at one of the best ones that evolution has to offer. And we read this in our textbook that antibiotic resistance, in other words, bacteria become resistant to our antibiotics. There is evolution happening right before our eyes. New information. Well, folks, that is absolutely incorrect. And we need to start getting back to teaching good science in our classrooms, not making up stories. See, what really is happening here when these bacteria become resistant to an antibiotic is that it comes because of a loss of protein functionality. The protein that carries that antibiotic in the system no longer works, so the antibiotic doesn't get in there, and it appears that we have developed a resistance. No, it is all due to a loss of function never a gain. I doubt this guy can even spell the word science, let alone dictate what type should be taught in classrooms. Bacteria developing resistance to antibiotics is indeed evolution because the definition of evolution is a change in allele frequencies in a population over time. That is precisely what's happening. As for how bacteria respond to the antibiotics, he is again wrong. Bacteria don't just pump the antibiotics out, they can also develop ways to neutralize the antibiotics, or they can change the site the antibiotics attack. Now, he certainly wants to talk about teaching stories. He wants teachers to tell children that a magical deity poofed the universe into existence for no reason whatsoever, magically made the earth for no reason whatsoever, and magically made life for no reason whatsoever. And the differences between us and chimps are um, the kinds of things that require coordinated mutations, things that work together. Anne Gouger, I think that's how you pronounce her name, is another creationist. Surprise again. As to what coordinated mutations are, a quick look at the internet shows that almost all sources on coordinated mutations are from creationist websites. Look at that. The scientific papers that concern coordinated mutations only talk about them with reference to cancer research because these coordinated mutations are mutagenic clusters that cause cancer without affecting the whole genome. One scientific article titled, Clusters of Multiple Mutations, Incidents and Molecular Mechanisms, says, open quote, Mutations generate the genetic diversity that enables biological evolution by natural selection and allelic drift. Close quote. Does that really sound like coordinated mutations have anything to do with disproving evolution? As an interesting side note, the background is fake. She isn't actually in a lab, she just wants to make the Discovery Institute look scientific by using a green screen of one. To prove it, here's atheist Hammett Meta in front of the same background after he bought the picture from Shutterstock. I imagine that's more than a little awkward for the creationists. So it's not enough just to get, say, 20,000 independent mutations that occur over six million years and, hey, presto, you've got a human being. No, you've got to have uh, mutations that work together. You have to have the right legs, feet, and pelvis to be able to walk upright, along with the correct spine and a neck that's long enough so you can actually get your head upright and see where you're going. Um, those are coordinated changes and 
Uh, if they happen individually, the benefit is not there. So you have to have all of them together. We've done work with bacteria that suggest that um, you can't even get a simple protein to change its function to a new function in way past the age of the universe. If it requires six or more mutations that are coordinated, you can't do it. Her whole spiel about how human anatomy is the sole result of coordinated mutations is entirely fabricated. She's just making up information. The ability to keep one's head upright was evolved in Devonian amphibians, not humans. Also, the fossil record very clearly demonstrates the evolution of a spine, pelvis, feet, and legs for bipedal hominids. Just look to Artipithecus, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, and our own skeleton. How does she know that there is no individual benefit? What research has she done on this topic to prove that statement? She has absolutely no understanding of evolution. The statements about how not even bacteria can have protein changes is potentially a flat lie. The long-term E. coli experiment performed by Dr. Richard Lenski and his team at East Lansing University showed definitively that bacteria can experience protein changes. Since this woman's testimony might have been made before the results of the experiment were made public, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Upon seeing the final topic of this video, I've decided to just wrap it up here since I already know what is going to be discussed. The author is going to try to make the case that the probability of all the mutations in our body would have occurred is so astronomical that it's not worth consideration. The problem with this argument is that on the scale of evolution, probability isn't really an issue. If you look at the probability of any daily event occurring, then you'd realize immediately that the probability the event would happen is basically zero. The probability I'd be born is basically zero, and yet here I am. In summation, this video is equally bad as all the rest, so I'm going to end it here. No bingo again. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.